the meeting to order. <laughs> uh, this is uh, the Wichita Public Schools workshop uh, on July 13th, 2020 at 12 noon in Wichita High School North Lecture Hall. And Wichita Public Schools will be the district of choice in our region where all students and staff are empowered to dream, believe, and achieve. I welcome you all that are here and everyone that's joining us remotely, and I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Dr. Willoughby, who has a statement to present before we start. Good afternoon. I am Mike Willoughby, clerk of the board. The meeting being held today is a workshop meeting. The only subject to be discussed by the board today is operational supports plans that will be implemented to provide safe and healthy environments. No binding action will be taken at today's meeting. It will be a discussion only meeting. Based on health and safety concerns due to COVID-19, the media and the public will not be attending this meeting in person. This meeting is available to be viewed and or listened to by the following means. One, WPS TV on Cox Channel 20. 2. USD259.org forward slash WPS TV online or 3. Live stream apps for phone, Roku and Apple TV by searching WPS TV. Board members, staff and others will identify themselves before they speak at today's meeting. Ordinarily, members of the public may attend workshop meetings. However, members of the public do not actually participate in workshop meetings. The public will not participate in today's workshop meeting. Following the conclusion of today's meeting, a recording will be available to be viewed on WPS YouTube channel. Thank you. Today's topic is future ready return to school plan operational supports. Good afternoon and thank you Board of Education members for gathering for our Future Ready Return to School Plan workshop on operational supports. Before I turn the presentation over to my team members, I would like to make a couple of comments. I'm starting and ending with wear your masks. If there is one simple act each and every one of us can do to create the safest possible environment for our return to school in August is to wear your masks. Many people have asked me what they can do to help and support schools during this difficult time, and three simple words just continue to come up in my mind, and that is wear your masks. I want to acknowledge and thank the WPS staff members and parents who are joining us online and on TV today to learn about the work being done to prepare the Wichita Public Schools for learning this fall. From the tens and thousands of responses we've received to survey inquiries, to comments that individuals have shared with me and with members of our pandemic leadership team, please know that we received your email, we are hearing you, and we are adding this to the comments that you've made to our discussions. In addition, I want to emphasize that what you will hear today, in fact, whatever you hear throughout this entire week, remember, this is not final. If you're at the table, if you're at your home, repeat with me, it is not <laughs> final. final. Um, and so please make sure you keep that in mind. And we want, wanted to take these workshop opportunities to discuss with our elected officials and to share our, with our stakeholders in order to review, discuss, and receive additional feedback. There has been so much shared in the last several weeks about guidelines and recommendations for students and staff returning to class this fall. And of course, we haven't received the final set of recommendations from our Kansas Department of Education and the Kansas Board of Education, and we won't get that until the end of the week. We are reading, and we are learning and we are evaluating our plans constantly based on these recommendations, which I would point out, all of those people that we're getting information from, none of them all agree. Whether the pediatricians or politicians, the Centers for Disease and Control, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, 
the Cedric County Health Department, the Kansas State Department of Education, the Council of Great City Schools, school superintendents across our state and country, professional organizations, parents, civic leaders, educators, students, and of course our WPS staff, all those who are providing feedback are doing so with their unique vantage point. And we are doing our best to hear and to respond to all of those voices. With that said, it is important that you all understand that we are building a plan based on facts and the best possible evidence available at the time, which I might note does change. We, when we bring to you our plan on July the 20th for WPS 150th year of public education, it will be the best possible plan we can offer as of July the 20th. But it's important to know that we will continue to ask, listen, and learn, and monitor, and we will be prepared to pivot if circumstances require us to modify our plan based on new evidence or public health considerations. This is worth noting again. We do anticipate changes in the guidance and circumstances over time, and we will be prepared to adapt and respond. I can't emphasize enough how important it is going to be in today's presentation and into the school year that we keep the themes of patience, flexibility, and grace in the forefront of our minds. This is hard work. In a matter of weeks this spring, our teachers learned how to modify their craft to engage students in new and different ways. For teachers and all of us staff members who were part of our school communities, we ask them to do much, we will ask them to do much the same time when we come back in the fall to be prepared for the circumstances that will likely be fluid throughout the year. Our facilities and operations employees, nutrition service workers, and security guards never stopped working. They heeded the call to support public education and have been working on site every day since our world changed in mid-March. And our leaders, including those you'll hear from in a few minutes, have worked literally, and I mean literally, nonstop since mid-March to tackle the difficult challenges ahead. To all of our employees, I want to say thank you, I commend you, and I stand with you in this difficult journey. Since the day I began as your superintendent, it has been clear that we matter to Wichita, and Wichita matters to us. And in the last four months, that, point, that pointed out to be true in full form as we've addressed the pandemic. In fact, it is abundantly clear to me that our schools really do reflect the heartbeat of this community, and we take that responsibility seriously. I will have a few follow-up comments to make after my colleagues are done, but for now, I'd be honored to turn the mic over to the phenomenal Fabian Amanderas, <laughs> the Division Director of Operations, and our wonderful Luke Newman, Division Director of Facilities, and the mighty Terry Moses, our Division Director of Safety and Environmental Services. So uh, colleagues, I'll turn the mic over to you. Well, good afternoon, President Logan, uh, Vice President Hedrick, Superintendent Thompson, members of the board. Uh, this afternoon, we are going to be giving you an update as to uh, some of the operational departments and the work that we've been doing to prepare for students as, as we get closer to the fall. Um, uh, a lot of work has gone into this, and I think as we get into the first slide, um, this tells you a little bit of the research that we've been doing. As Dr. Thompson mentioned, uh, we've had our teams engaged in doing research in terms of not only what other school districts are doing, but also what our uh, own job-specific organizations are recommending. Uh, as Dr. Thompson mentioned, not all of them agree, but we have been working very hard and diligently uh, to do research and make sure that whatever we bring to the table uh, is research-based. As you can see, uh, some of the uh, organizations that we've been working with, uh, Council of the Greater City Schools, uh, Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, and some of the recommendations that they've given us and guidance. Uh, Sedgwick County Health Department, as they give us our own specific uh, guidance based on what's happening locally. The Kansas State Department of Education, as they are looking to release uh, a plan here on the 16th of the month. Uh, the American Society of Heating and Air Conditioning Engineers, the Federation of European Heating, Ventilation, and Air Conditioning, 
Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, and the International Sanitary Supply Association. These are just a handful of some of the agencies, research that we've looked at. Again, there's a plethora of research out there, but these are the top ones that we've been looking at as we look at planning towards next year. So as we look at some of the recommendations that have been made, and I apologize because uh, the Spanish accent sometimes get in the way, so hopefully through the mask you're able to hear, <laughs> okay. Um, one of the, the biggest concerns that we've been hearing uh, from our staff, our community, has been about uh, our ability to be able to provide disinfecting supplies. Uh, hand sanitizer has been a hot topic of discussion. As you all know, it was unavailable there for a while. We are blessed in the Wichita community that we have a, a local vendor, the Wichita Brewing Company, that transitioned their business into making hand sanitizer. And so we were able, through them, to procure a large amount of hand sanitizer. Uh, we took the study that we did through RSP and Associates and identified the number of classrooms that we have district-wide and the number of common spaces. And using that number, we have procured enough hand sanitizer to equip every single one of our schools with enough hand sanitizer for all of these spaces that you see, classrooms, offices, common spaces. Those have already been delivered to the schools and are at the school awaiting. We've also purchased a large supply of extra that we're keeping in our supply warehouse at the school service center that will be available upon request for us to be able to get to the schools when, when those items begin to run out. Um, likewise, disinfecting wipes have been difficult to get. Um, and I want to give kudos and credit John Weiss, who's our purchasing manager, who's sitting in the back. Him and his team have been working diligently, nonstop, to make sure that we're procuring the right items. Not only that, but making sure that the pricing is correct. As you all know, the, the, the market is a little bit unstable right now. Um, through their work, we've been able to pro uh, procure disinfecting wipes to get the school year started. Um, again, for classrooms and common spaces. We're also looking at other disinfecting alternatives. Uh, we have Virex Plus, which is a medical grade solution uh, that we can make available uh, in spray bottles and also provide paper towels for, disinfect, for deeper disinfecting. We're also looking at different dis disinfecting sprays. We've also procured about 100 electrostatic machines that um, we'll be, um, all, also be able to use for some of this. So again, we've been looking at procuring a lot of these items and have been working diligently to get them here and to get them to our schools in time for start. Um, we do have a replenishment plan to begin with, and so our plan is every four to six weeks to reorder and to restock everything, uh, at least through the first semester. And then after that, then we'll be looking at adjusting based on need. We're also making the supplies available in our supply warehouse, so that way they're available upon request. So again, um, we are working diligently to make sure that we are making all of these items that are essential uh, available to our staff. Um, I will say this has been a very collaborative uh, project. We've been working with custodial, with facilities to make sure that uh, whatever supplies we're making available work with meet their needs, also that we are not taking from one side and going to the other. So we've been really uh, very strategic about making sure that we're communicating to one another so that, or with one another so that we're not duplicating efforts. So that's, that's what we have in regards to disinfecting supplies. All right. Well, thank you, Fabian. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Thompson and members of the board. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share what the Facilities Division has been working on with you today. Um, the solutions I'll be presenting were developed in consultation with the organizations previously referenced, uh, in addition to an extensive list of research articles, uh, webinars, and industry experts. The first area of focus I will speak about is our custodial department. I have Donald Bell here with me today, who is our custodial supervisor. Wave, Donald. <laughs> Uh, he and his staff have been working diligently to rethink our custodial practices and protocols post-COVID-19, and they've just done amazing, amazing work with it. Um, uh, we, we still have a lot of work to do in preparation for the fall, but here are a few key, initiative we'll, key initiatives we'll be implementing in the custodial department. We will be developing, or I'm sorry, we've been deep cleaning and disinfecting our buildings all summer in preparation for staff returning. Uh, we will be implementing enhanced disinfecting protocols with an emphasis on high touch points such as door handles, light switches, faucets, and et cetera. And this will occur, occur year round. It won't just be winter time when flu season is going on. This will be a year round thing. Um, we will clean restrooms twice a day. Our recovery rooms at special needs schools will be disinfected after every use. 
and high efficiency particulate vacuums, known as HEPA vacuums, will be used for carpet cleaning. These vacuums are proven to effectively uh, remove particulates up to 99.97% uh, uh, when they're traveling through the vacuum itself, so very efficient at removing particulates. We also have electrostatic fogging machines available to address, uh, address heightened building health concerns. These machines utilize a hospital-grade disinfectant, as Fabian mentioned, which produces a positively charged fog that wraps around the surfaces where it's applied. And I brought one with me here today. So uh, we have 100 more of these on order. We currently have uh, about 10 of them. And so we can deploy these at any point. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, we have some backpacks on order, which are more of the industrial uh, grade, so you can go out and, and really hit a lot more square footage in, in a shorter period of time. So um, I think we're, we're very, very prepared on that front. Uh, and of course, we'll make sure our staff is equipped with the proper PPE uh, for all work tasks. Uh, we will also be making some district-wide improvements to our buildings in the interest of student and staff well-being. Those improvements include installing uh, water, bill water bottle filling stations at all schools, and these are in high demand currently. Uh, our first shipment comes at the end of this month, uh, and then the second shipment comes in early August. Uh, we are committed to making sure these are installed at all schools prior to the start of school. Um, just want to make you aware of the lead time challenges associated with those bottle filler stations. Our milling shop is in the process of building plexiglass partitions for nursing staff and front office interaction with visitors. We are developing a comprehensive signage plan to encourage social distancing and proper hygiene practices at all buildings. And we are developing the appropriate facilities response protocol to address various COVID-19 scenarios in our buildings. This is being developed in conjunction with HR's efforts and will be outlined in a future meeting. Okay, the final area of focus that I'd like to share with you today is our HVAC operations. Studies have shown increased fresh outside air to be one of the most effective measures for preventing the spread of COVID-19. It is in that interest that the HVAC initiatives I'm about to cover have been developed and implemented. Before I get into it, I would like to give recognition and thanks to Randy Scott, who is here with me today as well. Wave Randy, thank you. Uh, Randy is our energy and mechanical systems manager, and he and his team have just done yeoman's work with this. Uh, just truly a terrific collaborative team effort. The changes that he and his team are, are implementing are uh, they'll be modifying bathroom exhaust fans to run 24-7 to maintain negative air pressure and, and ensure increased air changes. They'll be modifying outside air dampers to allow for a greater minimum setting of 20 to 25 percent fresh outside air. Uh, to allow for more outside air in, in our classrooms. And modifying our HVAC control schedules to run one hour earlier and one hour longer. When outside ambient uh, temperatures, let's see here, I think I'm on the next slide. Yes. When outside ambient temperatures and humidity conditions are optimal, the system will be set to allow additional outside air beyond the 20 to 25 uh, percent goal. And just to give you a point of reference, our, our current outside air, uh, the, the recommended ASHRAE outside air percentage is 15%. And so uh, it's quite a bit of increase. We will lower the chilled water set point for cooling mode to assist with dehumidification needs associated with increased outside air. With increased outside air comes the potential for elevated humidity levels, so we'll need to combat that, and this is, this is going to be our approach. We will run frequent trend audits in the HVAC control system, which is known as DDC, to measure the effectiveness of the changes made and adjust as necessary. We will install MERV 13 filters in nurses' offices for an additional level of filtration in the HVAC system. We will evaluate and implement alternative work models to ensure we are changing filters and conducting preventive maintenance and equipment, uh, pre preventive maintenance on equipment when students and staff are not present. We will equip our staff with the correct protocols and PPE to ensure safe working conditions when conducting this work. And we will properly sanitize and contain filters when removed to eliminate cross-contamination potential and ensure safe conditions for student and staff occupants. 
Okay, um, I'd like to just bring your attention to um, uh, kind of a large project we've been working on since this COVID-19 COVID stuff developed. Um, what we've done here is we've evaluated, uh, evaluated and segmented all building HVAC systems and types uh, as part of a concentrated effort to better coordinate system configurations with building usage. I've included a couple of examples to represent what this looks like. The first here is North High School, and the second is Curtis Middle School. And I wanted to show this to you because it, it gives you an idea of how diverse our systems are and the many variables that go into planning for building operation and usage. This information will help us plan in a number of regards. We are working with the academic team in a coordinated effort to align academic plans for building occupancy with the HVAC systems best suited to accommodate them. We will also be referencing this information when establishing the extent of containment and disinfecting measures necessary to address various COVID-19 scenarios that might arise. All right, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Terry Moses, to speak to you about what her team is doing with the visitor management system. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. As he said, I'm Terry Moses, Director of Safety and Environmental Services. I don't have a long list of things to talk about. I have one. Uh, but it's a very important one when we talk about COVID, and that is visitor management. As you've heard nationwide, we're socially distancing here. We need to control, and we need to make sure we control who comes into our buildings. Um, so what we have is actually something that we've had in existence since 2014, and that's our Hall Pass Visitor Management System. It has allowed us for the last six years to keep track of everybody who comes into our buildings, and we're gonna use that system to enhance how we keep track of, of who comes into our buildings. Uh, it provides screening for and accounting for all visitors in our buildings. Our current practice is basically when somebody comes into the school 10 minutes or from the beginning of school until 10 minutes after school, they are required to scan in. And if you've been to our buildings, you all probably have FOBs, but at some point you gave us your driver's license or some type of um, government issued ID as you came into the building. Uh, Luke, if you'll move to the next slide. In order to handle contact tracing, which is a big part of COVID and a part of those recommendations that Fabian referred to at the beginning of this slide, we are going to limit the number of people that go into our buildings to essential staff and to visitors. And really that breaks down into three different groups. In terms of essential staff, uh, we're talking about, just like Mr. Newman talked about, having people in the building only when it's empty and reduce the number of people that are in the building when our kids are in the building. But his staff will still check in and tell us where they've been if they've come into contact with students. But one of the things we're going to do is limit that by making sure they're doing as much work afterwards. The other kind of visitors that we have are our volunteers. And we're going to really uh, limit those to essential volunteers. We haven't made a concrete list of those because we have so absolutely many, 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 many people who do great work within our schools. So certainly those that we are contracted with, those that are providing essential educational services are gonna continue to have access to us, our schools, but we're going to con we're gonna make sure that we keep track of those. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to cut back on the cupcakes for birthdays. Um, the, the donuts with dads. Those kind of programs that we really can't say provide an essential educational value, those we're going to have to reduce uh, tremendously uh, just for the sake of limiting that contact. So all this and the final group of people we have, uh, I'm sorry, of course, are vendors. We have to have vendors that come into our building and it's the same thing as with Mr. Newman's. We're gonna try to limit those to as much as possible, not when people are in the, in the buildings, but certainly we have to have those. And I, I'm sorry, I'm going down my list. The final group is actually parents. Uh, parents and anybody who's a gardener, guardian of a child, we're gonna limit and we're gonna try to do as much virtually as possible. Uh, as we can with parents, but certainly in an emergency situation, parents and anybody who's uh, a guardian of a child will have access to our buildings. Upon scanning in, all visitors will designate the place that they're gonna go in the school. Right now, when you go into a school, you've just walked in, you give us your fob, we know you're in the building. Now we're gonna slow you down a little bit and we're gonna ask you where you're going. Hey, I'm going to Mrs. Smith's class. We will actually enter that information into that hall pass system so it'll be captured and out of this huge building, 
we'll know that you went into one classroom. Again, for that contact tracing, that'll give us the flexibility to do that. If you go back one, but he's, he's and uh, when you check out, we're going to verify that that's where you went in our building and that you didn't go somewhere else and that we don't have to add that somewhere else in the process. And then our final slide here is the example. This comes directly from the Hall Pass training manual. Basically, you'll see you can kind of read very, it says destination over there, and that'll, that's what it'll show up like. So we'll be able to track that. And should we have a situation where we have a COVID positive employee, staff member, student, whatever, we'll be able to very quickly go back and be able to do contact tracing to help our medical professionals and Sedgwick County as they work through that process. So that's our contact tracing visitor management uh, process that we have set up uh, for the upcoming school year. Other operational areas, and before I move forward, I failed to note, even though it's in the presentation, the hand sanitizer we procured uh, is 75% alcohol. I know that that's been a concern in our community. The CDC recommends 60%, so it is well above uh, to help combat the virus. So I did want to make mention of that too. Uh, finally, other operational areas, as, as we discussed, our print center is working with facilities and strategic communications to provide standard signage. That is part of the work that we're doing to make sure that we are promoting social distance and making sure that our signage, uh, so all those materials are being created and will be created internally in our print shop uh, to be able to do that. Um, purchasing continues to work on procuring supplies that we need and that work will continue as we enter the school year. As you know, there's a lot of supplies that are in high demand and difficult to get. So they've been doing a phenomenal job and we'll continue to do that. Uh, our supply department is working to catalog process, uh, to catalog all items that uh, uh, we are going to make available for our school, so we'll be working on that too, uh, to make sure that the process is seamless, supply chain from ordering to getting to our schools that, are, that we have what we need. And finally, I know there's been a lot of discussion about nutrition services and transportation. Those are two items, two areas that are of high interest to our community. Right now, those items are gonna be presented along with uh, the plans for the structure of the school day. Um, I've gotta give a lot of credit to Dr. Irving and the assistant superintendent. This has been really a collaborative approach. As, as, as I talk to other districts, we hear of the operations side making decisions in silo and the academic makes their own decisions. Uh, we've been very strategic about collaborating with each other. We understand that the work of these two areas impact each other and the impact the structure of the day. So sometimes you can't have one without the other. And so we wanna make sure that we're working together to, uh, through some of that. So those plans, we are working on them. They will be coming as part of the overall plan. So I just wanted to make sure that I pointed those things out. So that's really all that we had for you. Uh, we wanted, as we wrapped up, to connect the work that we've been doing and tie it to the strategic plan. You as a Board of Education had the foresight uh, to make the safety and security of our students, staffs, parents, and community, one of our long-term goals, uh, which is goal number four. And a lot of the work that we've been doing closely aligns with that, and we've been keeping that at the forefront of the work that we've been doing. So everything that we've done, we've tried to do and look at through the lens of the strategic plan. So, so at this time, um, I'd like to open it up for any uh, questions, um, that any of our elected officials at the table may have at this time. And so I'll turn it over to our president, uh, vice president to con uh, conduct the process. Okay, very good. Uh, looks like first we have a question from Mike Rohde of District 5. I Mike. actually have several. Um, we talked about parents. Are we gonna, when they come in for school drop off, are we gonna allow parents to come in with their children to school? Excellent question, um, and you're reading our minds. Uh, we have stopped that pra pra practice in all of, almost all of our schools just for safety reasons in past years. We have a couple of schools that still allow that, and so uh, this year we're going to recommend no, except for the pre-K. The pre-K are younger, and we do do a handoff where you know a pre-K student's actually handed off to a, a, a parent or a staff member 
Because those are fairly small numbers and then they're generally staggered in both their coming and going, we believe we can socially distance through that pre-K process. But everybody else will drop me, they're dropped off by a bus or at the front or at a reception or at door within a school and they will not enter the school at that point. If they choose to enter that school at that point, it'll be through the hall pass system because they have an appointment or they want to talk to somebody in the office. Okay. The other thing was the volunteers and people coming in during the day. Why would we allow anybody other than staff, paid personnel, to come? You know, we're limiting our own people to the building to after hours. Mm -hmm. Why would we allow any other volunteers to come into our building at, during school hours? Well, we've worked really hard, for example, with ComCare uh, to improve the services that we, we uh, provide for kids. Uh, in the area of mental health and that social emotional learning and we have a contract with them and receive money from the government for that program and we have several programs that like that they aren't really volunteers but they aren't truly our staff and those kind of situations we feel it's very important that they continue for the mental health and well-being well-being of our uh, children and that I agree with because that would be something that we would need to continue and that's to me that's not a volunteer that's a paid that's something we're paying for and we need to continue to do yes sir um the, the other thing is is you know, our children bring in backpacks and books and coats and mm -hmm. and they're they could be contaminated how are we going to handle that as they come through the front doors uh we are working on suggestions as part of these suggestions that you saw on the front for example some people don't recommend not using lockers because they don't want to get area of congregation well if you don't use lockers and you have to have backpacks but one of the things we've been run working on district-wide is really to go more virtually so you have to carry fewer things with you now as we get into the fall months people are going to need coats and we'll have to do the same thing we're doing, we're all doing, and that is social distancing and make sure that we have a place for them to keep that stuff so that it's not just piled up in a group area. Okay. And my last question is, is you know, we've got these sprayers that, that we've, we're procuring, which I think is a great deal. Are we going to, if a classroom empties out during the day to go to, the, like, the gym or... Are we going to go in and spray that room while they're gone, or what's the protocol with that? Yes, there's there's a whole protocol we've outlined, and um, we'll be we, HR is going to be presenting on that. I think okay. later this week, Friday, and and we're going to roll the facilities piece in with that presentation as well. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your hard work, Ernestine. One of the questions that I had maybe needs to be answered later on, but if we make the decision to have staggered classes, how are we going to do the cleaning in between the students or even in between the days that the students come? It's a good question. It's part of the revised custodial protocols we're, we're working on. Um, and as we get more answers on our plans for the academic side of things, we'll definitely be aligning with that on the custodial, on the custodial side. Um, and in each, each model that, that we have, whether it's virtual versus remote or uh, in school, all are going to have separate cleaning protocols because okay. it looks different if you're going Monday, Tuesday, off Wednesday, Thursday, whatever it is that you, I mean, whatever it is that they, they're going to bring. I don't know what it is. I'm just, that's an example, everybody. Don't <laughs> say that I, this is what we're going to do. It's an example. Um, if we do something like that, then what would happen is it would be a different protocol. If we are in school, if, if, if we are in school uh, five days out of the week with some out and some in or whatever, then that would be another cleaning protocol. Okay, so again, it's just specific to the model that is selected. Okay. I will say there's, there's been uh, an effort, uh, a concentrated effort, I think, that's been made to, to try to figure out ways to cohort groups, obviously, throughout the buildings, if we are in school <laughs> five days a week, whatever it may be, yeah. um, to where our disinfecting protocols, they're not, they wouldn't get quite as, as out of control as they might be if you have students traveling all over the building, you know, frequently, there, that'd be a little bit harder to, um, to keep up with. Ron? Yeah, Ron Rosales, District 6. 
Um, I was just wanting to find out what's our current, or what was, I guess, our current um, filter changing schedule, and how does that compare to what you were referring to in, in your... Randy, I might need your help with this one. Randy, Randy, come on down because again we have me, uh, we. I'm sure there's thousands of people watching, and we want them to hear every word you say. Um, and then you can actually keep your mask on. And I'm going to ask that we give him a cloth mask so that he's not muffled. Do we have another? Okay. They said go ahead and just yes. If you put that one on so that you're not muffled and we don't have any problems with people understanding and hearing what you're saying. Thank you so much, Randy. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so currently we we change filters quarterly um, that's our standard practice but that will change a little bit obviously we'll, we'll still maintain the quarterly filter changes but depending on a suspected or a known case we will modify and change those filters accordingly and we would sanitize the the coil in that unit as well so what we want to do is just pre prevent any chance of a secondary spread from the HVAC unit is what we're trying to do and Are that there gets any back into the, the protocols we referenced uh, that we'll be reviewing with HR later this week. So that's all Correct. rolled in with that. Okay. Any particular um, filter or are they just standard filters we're using or, and that we're going to use? We, we are about a MERV 8 or MERV 9 filter. And there's some, there's some equipment limitations to go to a higher MERV rated filter. Um, you get a static pressure drop across the, the unit. And what it happens is the unit trips out. So we're doing the best we can with some of the equipment limitations that we have. So we'll, we'll stay with the filters we have, and we'll just make sure that as we change filters, we disinfect coils. And then we will also treat the filters when we remove them before we take them out of the buildings to, pretend, to prevent any cross-contamination. What, what, we're, what we're generally hearing is that um, you shoot yourself in the foot to a certain regard if you put too high a level right, of filter in, right. your, in your system because you don't get the air flows that you need. Right. Now, we're looking at when I talked about putting them in our nurses' offices, we're making sure that we're still maintaining the correct amount of airflow and outside air that we're introducing into those spaces. But in our classrooms, we're, we're definitely limited with some of the systems that we have. And so by putting in a, a MERV 13 filter, you actually shoot yourself in the foot by, right. by reducing your outside air, which is actually a much, you, there's a much greater benefit to increasing outside air than there is to having MERV 13 filters. Correct. And speaking of outside air, you were saying something about um, uh, how much would come in and I guess if would that would mold develop um, in some cases, and if so, how, how would that be detected? Yeah, that's why we're taking a close look at that on what we're doing with the humidity control and reducing our cooling set points on our coils um, to where we're actually wringing out by dropping it down. We're we're pulling out more more moisture from the from that outside air that's being introduced. So the idea is that, no, our spaces should, should be maintained the same amount okay. of humidity as, as they have been, um, if not better. Better, and we are gonna lower the fan speeds where we can as well, so that we can increase that contact time on that coil to help dehumidify better. And is anybody um, thinking about, and this might be a question for you, Dr. Thompson, but, um, so if a teacher says, hey, I got this really cool dehumidifier or filtration system, a portable one, is there anything? They won't that need that. Okay. They won't need okay. it because ours is going to override whatever little bitty thing okay. that they would be able to bring <laughs> in. Ours is a comprehensive Sounds plan, like so, it. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. I was just wanting okay. to see if, what, what our stance was on that if somebody decided to bring something in from home. Thank you. Thank you. Luke, also, as far as outside air is concerned, is um, is it okay for staff to just open their windows so that they get more outside air in just from the natural environment? Is that acceptable or not? Yes, um, I would say yes. Um, there's definitely it, it, there's a certain amount of uh, conditioning that is I guess I would say that it somewhat limits your ability to condition spaces effectively when you just start opening windows, depending on how humid it is outside. Um, so I think as a best practice, I, that wouldn't be my preference. But in the times we're in, I would say I would say that yes, it's it's I would say it's a good thing, wouldn't you, Randy? Yes. yes. We obviously, would want to make sure that they're closed. Randy, come back down. I'm sorry. <laughs> if it was, I mean, you know, if it was just us, that's good. But we want to make sure all the all the peeps can hear you. 
from a security perspective, we would want to ensure that those windows get closed at the end of the day. That's the other thing, yeah. especially a first floor window. Mm -hmm. If it's open for fresh air and then left open, that would be a bad situation. Absolutely. Well, and then also if a staff member would like to be able to open their window and find out that it's like been painted shut at some point in time and so it sticks and so they have difficulty, yeah. is that something that would be able to be addressed by facility staff or would they just be out of luck? I mean, yes, what? no, we, we can definitely help help with that as um, as we always do. Um, I, I, I will say that, I you know, with the measures we're taking on bringing in the 20 to 25 percent outside air, um, you know, we feel pretty strongly that, that we're bringing in plenty of fresh outs, outside air, so it shouldn't be necessary. But if, if staff feel that they'd like to do that, we're not going to tell them no. Yeah, thank you. And Mike, you had another question? Yes, I do. Um, a couple of them, and in, in the first one, you, know, you, go, you go back to your first slide that was presented about all the different, you don't need to do it now. Okay. All the different communities that we talk to one of the things that that I'm confused with severely confused with after listening to uh, sports this weekend there was a race car driver that tested positive for COVID a week ago and came back and he was I don't know the term a systematic so he didn't show any signs of disease but his wife also ch tested positive and with the same condition and a week later he's tested twice and had no coronavirus within a week and it started me to think and because and, and I know that this may be a question that can't be answered and and I understand that I'm sorry I asked these questions but somebody needs to explain to me before we go back to school what that meant you know they're they're saying we got to quarantine for 14 days but within a week he's cleared and how many false positives are we getting? How many false negatives are we getting? You know, what is, you know, if you've got, if you're testing positive for it and you're not showing any signs, I'm confused because, you know, you're not, if you're not sick, you're not sick in my mind. And I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one on TV. But uh, I think we need to understand that a little bit more before we go back to school because, you know, if, you're testing positive with, you know, you listen to all the statistics that you see on TV, and I'm so confused with that because they don't match up. This TV station reports this way. This TV station reports another way. If you listen to the national people, they're finding all sorts of reasons to make it a horror story. I don't know if it's a horror story or not, and I'd like to know a little bit more about that, if I could, and get some explanations to the statistics. And is there a false positive? Is there a false negative? to these testing that we're now doing hundreds of thousands of tests a day now versus a handful that we could when we could get them you know it doesn't make any sense and that that's one of the leading things to me as far as going back to school and preparing because you know if we don't if I don't understand them somebody else doesn't understand them and that could be a fear you know and we don't want fear coming into the schools we want to know what's going on and you know the second part of that question is are we going to do testing on a regular basis of our staff to see if they're they're coming in with, with all, COVID? all of that will be some dis be discussion at our friday okay. meeting because again this goes back to the employee right. and all of the things that happened if because you know there's lots of questions what happens if there's a case in the building what it happens what are they going to do how are they going to clean this right. i mean all of that will be addressed on Friday. And okay. so we're gonna add this to the presentation as it relates to the testing. Um, and as I hope somebody's writing it down, my team, um, as it relates to testing, and then as it relates to the, uh, a, uh, the, uh, the whether the testing and how, it, if it's false, negative, all that, what does all that mean? And I will tell you, we are not the experts, we're educators, we're not health professionals. So we'll have to see about if we can get someone in 
that will be able to answer those specific questions so that there's credibility in the answers that we're given because we don't, we're not gonna be able to do that credibly because we are not medical professionals. So we will let those folks uh, answer those questions. And, and that's why I'm uh, asking it now because I knew it was a deal that would come up yeah. Friday and yeah, we, I thought it'd we, give you some We're time. gonna address all of that on Friday, but as far as the questions about the testing and the reliability of those and all that, we'll, we'll need to have someone come in and talk about okay. that. And I appreciate that. I understand yeah. that totally. Yes. Um, my, th my last question that I'll bother you with today is, is as I've looked at this and I looked at looked back when we started the uh, when this all started and we shut the schools down and we did the school lunches and the the uh, school packets to kids and we had some some mistakes made because we had to do it so quickly and we didn't have the time to respond like we do now you know we've got a chance to take a breath and we're ready to go and we knew this was coming and school, I believe, is the first day of, or the 13th day of August. Have we, is there any consideration to putting that back 15 days? We, we have actually had some of those conversations, but there has not been any um, decision about that because what we do have two, according, when we had our last conversation, again, everything is day to day, but right. our last conversation was, was last week. We still have two cycles of 14 days before school starts. So that gives us a little bit of time to kind of see what's going to happen as people wear their masks and social distance and do what they're supposed to do. If we continue to get on that decline, that's an amazing thing, that's awesome. But if we don't, then that will then become kind of some of the questions that we need to be able to address here. And again, July the 20th may not be the final because again, we still have another cycle before school starts back up to determine whether or not we'll go with what we said on July the 20th. So again, it all is fluid and we have to just be patient and kind of wait a little bit to see what's going to happen. Okay, and I do have one more question and again, this is a, one of those that may not have an answer. But as I was sitting there watching the news last night, they showed that Florida is jumping significantly because of all the summer vacations that are happening they opened disney world up and they did this and did that and the beach parties that they're having and spring break and winter break is coming up and that made me think you know if we've got people that are traveling out of state to florida to to wherever colorado are we gonna do we should we be tracking that so that we know that if because yes. they could be bringing things back to us that we don't know about, and that would be a big concern. Absolutely, and we do have um, that in our protocols that we will be discussing on Friday. That's absolutely one of them. Okay. Uh, we, you travel out of here, you gotta let somebody know what's going on, where you've gone, if it's a hot spot. I mean, there's just tons of protocols that we have that we will be discussing on Friday about that. So absolutely, and there has been discussion um, and we did put that out to staff in a survey uh, that, uh, that we ask about uh, that because we know that uh, that winter break and that flu season, that period of time that's in there, that December uh, through I think February time frame, there's a stronger, there, there's a lot going on when you have COVID and the flu season. And we asked staff, would they be willing to, you know, kind of, um, you know, rearrange the schedule and not do spring break and then extend the winter time break so that we can have time out so that we're not together doing that hot spot time. And then also to keep in time with the minutes and their work to eliminate the spring break so that alleviates the travel for spring break. And we have not received all of the feedback yet, so we're still gathering that. So if you have not filled out your survey, please fill it out because that is a question that we are asking and that would solve kind of what you're asking. About. Yeah, I mean, so we're that, getting feedback on that as well. That was one of the scariest things because when we start mixing people in airplanes and mm -hmm. and and it's not the kids that I'm as worried about as I am the adults because they're going to go. You know, they, it seems like we've gotten a lot of criticism about spring breaks and not aligning with different things, and so we get. You know, there's a lot of people that think that's a big important deal, and I, you know. By then, where will we be? I don't know. You know, that's another problem that we could have is this could be disappearing. Yeah. 
but it would be terrible for it to reappear in our schools because somebody went to Florida for a beach party. Yeah. Um, Cheryl and Stan, I still know you're there. I'm not going to forget you before we uh, finish questions, but um, I yeah. do have... Okay, very good. Well, we're we're gonna go to Ben next. Okay. Hello. Yes, yeah, yeah, Cheryl, we, we'll, we hear you, and Stan, we hear you, and Ben is up next, and then we will be able to communicate with you all as soon as uh, Julie recognizes you. Um, ben Blankley, District One. Um, how many uh, custodial staff do we have on average for, say, a typical elementary, middle, high school, special school? I want to say it's somewhere around three, four, Donald, for elementary. Right. And middle school is something like five to six. Right. And high schools are 10, 12, 14 on the high side. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think everybody here at the board tables asked questions, so we will go back to uh, Ernestine in a second here, but let's catch um, Cheryl. Why don't you go ahead with your questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, Cheryl Logan at, at large, um, and thank you for letting me call in today. I will be doing the same on Wednesday, but I'll be back on Friday. Uh, my questions may be answered on Wednesday or Friday, but I, I want to make that Cheryl, we're losing you. Can you, um, Cheryl, we're losing you. Can you repeat your question, please? Yeah, um, these questions may be answered in um, the Wednesday or Friday presentation. And those are. I'm sorry, Cheryl. You Hello? start out you start out very clean, and then you will, will uh, filter okay. out. So I, can just, you... I just changed to rip the speaker, so okay. hopefully that will help. Okay, try again. Uh, my <laughs> my questions. Uh, first of all, it's about training, because obviously we are changing protocols dramatically from what we have done with custodians and our teachers and others. Uh, Will, those inf will that information about training to make sure that our staff is aware of everything we're, re we're going to be requiring? Yes. Will that be included in our presentation later this week? Yes, professional development will be on Friday. Okay, the, my next question is about the plexiglass that we're putting up in the nurse's office and, and the office areas. Will we also be looking at some kind of dividers for kids if we can't socially distance correctly in our classrooms? Um, the answer is yes. We are having conversations and making sure that we can procure enough plexiglass and be prepared to um, measure and do whatever else we need to do to make sure that we have that. Most we have enough square footage, and if I say it wrong, my friend can stop me, but we do have enough square footage in our buildings to, for the majority of our schools, not all, so don't get, everybody don't say she said all, it's not all, but the majority of our schools, we have enough square footage to be able to social distance using our desks. There are some spaces that are not gonna be able to do that, some schools, some areas, and we will take those cases, case by case, and we will make the uh, plexiglass available to some of some of those additional areas as needed. Am I? Good. It's I'm glad I'm looking at that because I, I know it's going to be difficult in every building, every classroom to socially distance. Yeah, I want to make sure that's be crystal clear. clear. Yeah. I don't know that um, that our classrooms, I will say that our buildings have the square footage to socially distance. But the classrooms themselves, depending on how many students you put in them, I would not say that you have enough square footage to social distance. So in order to appropriately social distance, we'd have to get pretty creative about how we utilize our square footage in the buildings. Um, and I do also want to mention plexiglass. Um, it, it, there's going to be some challenges lead time wise there. Uh, and Fabian can speak to that. Um, there's definitely, uh, obviously, there's a huge demand for it out there right now. Uh, we're building some. We're building 300 in the milling shop right now, um, but that's uh, and that's taking us about to, a month to make. And so, 
obviously, if we roll this out on a much larger scale, um, it'd be very challenging for our milling shop to keep up with that demand. So uh, it would be a lot of it would depend on the supply that's available on the open market. And yeah, we're looking at procuring some of those items, uh, not only for, for the creation of them. I know that we're also looking at potential partnerships throughout our city of, of other agencies that could potentially make them. And then we're also looking at those that are pre-made also. So we are looking at alternatives. Again, they're, they're in short, short, I mean, there's just a lot of demand for them, but we are looking at uh, procuring as much of it as possible. And at that time, this time, I'd like to give a shout out to WSU Tech as also as the Wichita Chamber of Commerce. Uh, for partnering with us on the procurement of some of these items as well. Cheryl, is that That's wonderful that we're using our community. Uh, I have one more question, and, uh, and again, these may be answered later this week, but you, we didn't address lunches nor transportation in today's presentation. Are those coming later? Yes, they will be coming on Wednesday, I believe. Yes, I'm not, my team are nodding. We're ready on Wednesday for those, absolutely. We'll be addressing them. Well, kudos go out to your team, Dr. Thompson, and all the hard work that everybody's put in because we are, we are absolutely in the middle of a major transformation in this district that, you know, because we're so concerned about our staff and student safety. So and I, thank you very much. And I'm going to just uh, extend that thank you as you're doing it to the teachers and to our families who have been giving us feedback on a daily basis. We appreciate you. Keep the feedback and the ideas coming. Yes, I'm hearing lots of feedback too, and that's great. We need that, so thank you. Okay, Stan, do you have any questions? Hey, Julie, does Ernestine want to follow up on her question before I ask my three questions? Sure, she says yes, so we'll turn it over <laughs> to Ernestine. Well, I just have one okay. very brief one. I know that... It, over time, it's been difficult to keep custodians. And I just wonder, in this difficult time, are we having trouble filling all of those custodial spots that we have are going to be needing for all of these schools or that we need right now? I, I would say that currently there's enough of a demand out there or there's enough people seeking work that, that we're doing okay with filling our, our vacancies. And Donald, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I do anticipate in the fall we're going to have issues with custodians uh, being out on leave for various reasons, whether it be COVID-19 or other things, um, and there's going to be demand for sub-custodians, um, I think much greater than, than what we normally would encounter. Donald, does that sound about right? And so those of you who are listening that are looking for employment, <laughs> Uh, there are opportunities to sign up uh, for the Wichita Public Schools in that particular area if you have interest for there. And also, Fabian has his eyes all bucked. We bus also drivers. will be looking for <laughs> bus drivers. I knew he was going to have you say that. So if there are, we in do have nutrition, service and nutrition services. services. So we do have employment opportunities in our substitute areas for nutrition service workers, custodians, and bus drivers full time. Uh, so please, please, please. Uh, go to our website and apply. Okay, so Stan, it's your turn. Thank you, Julie. Stan Reeser, District 4. I just got uh, three quick questions because um, I, I obviously have a lot more than that, <laughs> as all of us do, uh, but I think most of them is going to be covered on Wednesday and Thursday, uh, Wednesday and Friday. Um, as some of you know, first off, let me just say that Anything I, any questions I have, I am. I just want the public to know that I'm not prejudging anything. I'm going to listen to all the information that we have that we are presented this week, and so don't take anything too much into my questions. They are just questions that are uh, that I think need to be answered. We are. I work at the hospital, and we are two to three weeks away from being at capacity. That's. Uh, public knowledge that's being assimilated or being put out there this week. Um, and so that asks me, that makes me ask the question, and I don't know if Tom's there today, but do we have the legal option to start the school year online or remotely? 
Tom doesn't need to answer that question. We are here with our experts here. And yes, you have, um, as it relates to the KSDE document, the draft document, uh, again, we don't get final, but in the draft document, the draft document, not the final document, right. uh, it, it does lean for us to be able to do all three options, which are in school, and I'm looking at my eyes of my expert over here, in school, remote, or hybrid. So we have okay. three options to select from, depending upon where we are in our community at the time, and as a school district, we need to be able to transition into some of these models uh, with ease. So that, are, that is your options to select <laughs> from on July the 20th at that time, which could also change at any point. Right. Uh, so just make that, continue to make that clear. Stan Reese or District 4, um, if there is a July 4, um, that uh, hospital being at capacity could actually be shorter than two to three weeks, depending if there's a July 4th uh, bump. Um, and I realize that, and I would think what's going to be important for the public to understand is that a, a small school district out in western Kansas that has very few cases, their reopening is probably going to look a lot different than the reopening in Sedgwick, Shawnee, Wyandotte County, Johnson County, et cetera, where the cases are still climbing. Um, I think this next question, I think, is probably going to be answered on Wednesday or Thursday. But Dr. Thompson, do we have any word yet on w when we expect to hear about fall and winter sports and extra, act extra activities, extracurricular activities? We, those extracurricular activities are not underneath the um, umbrella, it's underneath the umbrella, but it is not under the decision-making umbrella of KSDE or the school board, state school board. Those decisions happen with KSHA. And so we will be following the KSHA guidelines. So whatever they make, whenever they make decisions and give us directions about athletics and sports and those kinds of things, we will respond accordingly from the direction from Keisha. And when do we expect to get word from them? Well, we, we get word from them, um, seems to be whenever there's a decision that they are going to be making that's different than we hear what that decision is. We never know if they're discussing it or those kinds of things. Well, let me, sh I should take that back. We do have people that sit on that team uh, of people that are at Keisha, uh, but as of today, and I have not heard in, uh, recently that there has been any dis decisions or any conversations about closing any of the uh, athletic um, sports at this point. Now, we can control as far as who gets to watch them, but uh, there has not been any decision at this point about uh, any of those kinds of things. Stan Reeser, District 4, perhaps we ought to send them a note telling them that we are not obviously stepping on their turf, but the earlier they can give us some direction, the better. And then my final question is, do we need to invite for either Wednesday or Friday, would it be prudent to invite maybe the top Cedric County Health Department official uh, to either our Wednesday or Friday workshop and see if we could squeeze in a presentation from him or her on what we are looking at and what we are facing here in Cedric County. Um, we can definitely put a request in um, to see if there's some availability of those folks. And we did, I did mention that when, when Mike asked, we will be looking to see if there's someone that could come answer your health related questions. Uh, because of course we, we know enough to be a little dangerous, but uh, right. we're not experts. Stan Reese or District 4, are there any other members who would think that uh, perhaps having a, some kind of uh, presentation from the Sedgwick County Health Department uh, would be a good idea? I mean, even if it's even uh, on the July 20th meeting. Okay, it looks as if you're, uh, I'm, I'm not in charge, you are. I'm sorry. 
I'd like to put in there, if we're going to do that, I don't want a canned presentation that's telling us one thing that the county wants us to hear. I want to hear the real facts and the real truths. And I don't know who that would be. But can research district four. I understand that, Mike. I, and I and what we have to do is is you know, I, what I'm really asking for is just a real brief, direct statement from the Cedric County Health Department on trends and their recent numbers. And they could do that. I think they could do that in five to ten minutes. And. I would not ask them to stray off into projections into the future. Just what is the trend this week? What was the trend last week? That type of thing. I would think we would want them to do that, Stan. I think, uh, you know, we would want them to stray into everything that we could get them to stray into to make our decisions because we're looking at August 13th, which is basically, a, you know, a month away. This is Cheryl. Go ahead, Cheryl. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl Logan at large. I feel like Alicia and her team have been in extremely close contact with the CDC and with our health department and with others, and we're getting that information. That That's part of the reasons we're making some of the decisions we're making. If it changes, I would expect, Dr. Thompson, is this true, that they would be letting you know that we're seeing something different coming down than what we've anticipated or talked with you about before? Yes, and not only that, you have your state official health officials that are in contact with KS, uh, uh, the Kansas State Department of Ed, whom we meet with weekly, every week. And then we also are meeting with our Cedric County officials and we meet with them whenever they whenever requested. In some instances, uh, they review our documents. They they've been engaged with us. They've given us feedback on everything that we we're presenting. And um, so, or, or most things that we we are doing, we're getting guidance from them. However, you know, if if it's going to help with decision making, um, we're definitely uh, uh, willing to bring in whomever you all want. So, Dr. Mike, as far as the protocol, do we just need head shaking from everyone, or do we take a vote on whether to invite uh, Dr. Mins to come to the meeting? What? Well, this is a this is a board workshop, and as it notes on the worksheet for today, although a quorum of the board may be present, uh, there can be no action at this meeting, so it it would have to be by consensus. Okay, so kind of I'm I'm looking at everyone to see if we have some head nodding. Um, Ron, you're not particularly interested. I think Dr. Thompson's everything that we've been getting is suffice. Okay, and Cheryl was kind of opposed to it, so if we have to do it by consensus, then I guess we'll just um, leave it leave it in Dr. Thompson's hands to let her team make the presentation. And and if we if if since the questions that you all have asked, if you have additional ones, please uh, send them to if this is appropriate to Dr. Mike, then I will visit with the uh, officials myself and bring the information back and if it's a daily then i can bring all that back also uh at our wednesday meeting and at our friday meeting i can get the daily numbers for the days that we we're doing in that day then you'll have that then i'll ask your question about the testing and be able to have some articulation as it relates to the testing and any other questions that any of you may have for the officials i can get those answered and then bring them back and actually even have them in writing for you and bring them back for discussion at this table, if that's appropriate for you all, if there's a consensus for that. Look at that that would satisfy me, Cheryl Logan. Uh, Mike, am I seeing a nod from yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got consensus on that, so that's how, how we'll move forward on that item. Thank you I, very I much. I think any information that we can get is gonna be to our benefit. The more we know, the better we, we can make that decision. Absolutely. And I think that's one piece of the puzzle, you know, even though they're communicating with us on a regular basis, I think if the public sees them at our board meeting and they hear them at our board meeting, it's going to put a little more comfort or a little more discomfort, whichever the way it is, um, 
into the, the facts that we're presenting to the people that we're trying to keep safe. And I think that's that's a benefit. That's a good point. A positive benefit for us, I believe. Good point. Because we're definitely not uh, medical professionals, and we definitely have to consult with them on these things because we want to make sure we're we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as uh, more questions and discussion for this workshop today, I see no one at the board table. Cheryl or Stan, do you have additional questions? This is Cheryl Logan at large. No, I think I've had my questions. I'm certainly looking forward to Wednesday, Wednesdays and Friday's presentation. Uh, I appreciate having this information given to us so that when we have to make the decision on Monday, we are basing it on the facts of what's going on. So thank you. Stan Research District 4. Uh, I'll just echo what Cheryl, uh, Cheryl just said. Uh, those were my only three initial questions. Um, Obviously, I'll have more on Wednesday and Friday and, and the Monday, July 20th, but I think this is a great start and I appreciate and I look forward to hearing the information on Wednesday and Friday as well. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank I, you. I would like to conclude. Sure. Some yes. Remarks, if that's okay with you. Guys. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. As we conclude, Mr. Rohde said no, but... Uh, <laughs> As we conclude, I want to remind our viewers about the many ways that they can remain engaged in the conversations that will occur this week, including Wednesday's workshop, focusing on learning opportunities, and Friday's workshop focused on human resources. And of course, next Monday, July the 20th, we are scheduling a Board of Education business meeting uh, during which our board will adopt the Future Ready Return to School Plan. And again, remember they can pivot if they need to. And um, our first, uh, each of our Board of, of, of Education workshops, as well as next Monday's regular meeting, will be viewable live online and on WPS TV channel 20. To view online, go to www.usd259.org, WPS TV live online, or download the live stream app. Second, I would encourage anyone who has comments or questions to share those via our info at usd259.net email address. I'll repeat it, info at usd259.net. This will allow us to assure we capture all questions and comments and we will answer those individually or where the questions are common, we will include answers on our WPS return website. Third, remain connected on our WPS return website where we will have links to today's presentations, all future presentations this week, and the plan we release on Monday. And fourth, please remember that what we share today is not yet our final plan. We are still listening, learning, and finalizing plans that will be brought to you on Monday, July the 20th for approval. Can you click to my last slide, please? <laughs> As I noted when I started, many people have asked me what they can do to support our community schools. If there is one message that I could leave with you today, and that is on our screen, mask up one month from today our adopted school year calendar has the 2021 year school year beginning that's four and one half weeks away and for us to have the safest possible chance in the environment of coming back to school in august i implore you to wear your masks wash your hands and continue practicing social distancing and what did I say again? Wear your, repeat it at the table, wear, wear your, your mask. mask. And with that, our workshop is done, unless you have any additional questions. Thank you all for attending, and we'll see you again on Wednesday.